Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here in this beautiful space. I like this space a lot. I have actually gave a talk last year on the invitation of this institution to talk about my intentions for the Swiss Architecture Museum. I will talk a little bit about that today as well, but I want to basically address the question, what do I think is the museum in the 21st century? And for me, the most important and influential experience that I've had in a museum in the past time, uh, let's say past 15, 20 years, was the weather project by Olofer Eliasson in the Tate um, Modern. This exhibition was amazing because it basically showed the potential of what a museum can be. It is not only a wunderkammer of objects that we place inside a museum and we adore these objects, but it can be actually something else. It can become an urban space. And Olaf Eliasson showed this in a beautiful way where he basically left the entire space empty um, <clears throat> and even kind of enlarged this very, very big space, the turbine hall in, in, in the Tate, uh, equipped the ceiling uh, with a reflective uh, surface, with a mirror, so that people could see each other. And they realized, actually, they were the objects of the exhibition. It was not about painting. It was not about sculpture. Or it was about what Joseph Beuys called the social uh, sculpture. The idea that we perform um, space, that we make meaning with our bodies in space. And uh, this exhibition was um, incredible in the sense that people understood very quickly that because there was nothing on display except this kind of sun, this artificial sun, that um, they could really play with this thing. This was not an exhibition in a didactic sense. It was an exhibition in terms of an invitation to play with the space. And this is what people did. They realized they could see each other in the mirror and started to make forms with their own bodies. This is probably the most powerful performative experiment in contemporary art of the past three decades, I think, in the sense that <clears throat> the artwork enabled to empower the people to free themselves of the behavioral protocols of what we think uh, we have to do in a museum. Normally, we think we have to go around silent, look at the artwork, pretend we understand everything, read learnedly um, the captions, and then go exhausted when the air conditioning really kills us and makes us tired. And <clears throat> The, um, the, the beauty of this project was really that people forgot about all that. They thought, well, if you are a son up there, right? If you pretend you are a son, I will pretend this floor is the beach, and I'll behave like I do on the beach. And this is very interesting because the rest of the museum is, of course, a white uh, cube gallery kind of museum. And people instantly, when they go from this space to the other galleries, they forget about this kind of liberation, and then start, of course, to behave learnedly as we are supposed to do it. Now, um, you know, I, 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 you can really see I wanted to do this talk in French. <laughs> Normalement, j'aurais pu le faire. Okay, um, but to be quick and not to explode the schedule, I do this in English. Um, this is interesting for me because um, I'm running an architecture museum, which for me is uh, basically a paradox. I actually believe you cannot make an architecture museum within a building. Because what are the, what are the, the, the works of architecture? Well, for me, they are actually the buildings. Yes, of course, we have exhibits, we have drawings, we have models, we have all of those kind of things. But these are representations. These are not the thing itself, right? So, and that's, that's an interesting, um, um, question, when you think about how do you fulfill the, the, the traditional criterion of being a museum, well, you have to have a collection. That's the idea. Now, a collection in, 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 of architecture in my museum would look normally like this. This is the ground plan of the uh, Swiss Architecture Museum in Basel. And I could go, of course, around and have models and display them there. It would create a situation. I don't know if you can see it. There's a gentleman at the um, lower left corner that looks uh, at a very tiny architectural model kind of in despair because actually, well, if that gentleman was me, would like to see this situation, right? I want to be overwhelmed by architecture. I want it to address me physically and to basically blow my mind. This is what I want to do architecture because this is what architecture can do. This is the, the um, I don't know any other public art that can um, influence your physical um, essence and existence in such a direct way like architecture. You can perceive it from outside, you can perceive it from inside. It's, it's 
most breathtaking experience. It's different than, uh, than in art, I would say, um, which has other kind of phenom phenomenal qualities. But the beauty of, um, the, um, of the artwork is really that, uh, of the architectural project, is that it's, it's uh, place-bound. It is not, never isolated. It always has a context. And it always has a materiality. And when we turn architecture into models and other representations, we deprive it of all that, which is, I think, a pity. That's why I'm wondering, couldn't one imagine a kind of collection, and thereby another type of museum, uh, for the Architecture Museum of Switzerland, where instead of us um, going around the country and shopping for great architectural projects, um, turning them or like buying models of them, if someone is nice enough to, to give us the money for that, and put them into the museum, couldn't we put the arrow on the other direction of the line? and make our audience go out in the country, go into the territory, G tell them where they can actually see uh, what's out there to exhibit. So for me, this would change the collection of the museum and also the notion of the museum, because basically that means the entire territory of Switzerland becomes the territory of the collection, and thereby also the territory of the museum. Um, we are working on a project where we try to establish how that could work, uh, with an app where we basically program a navigational um, device that helps people to discover architecture. So let's, let's assume this typical situation. An architecture uh, tourist comes to Basel, gets um, the architecture guide, and the guide tells them, you have to go and see the Spitalapotheke by Hasuk de Meron. So goes there, sees, oh yeah, nice building, minimal, super slick, looks still like in the 90s. <clears throat> and then you find out, okay, you can't go inside. That's very frustrating. This is the biggest frustration for me about architecture guides. They show you a picture of the facade. It helps you see the building. It says, oh, yes, that's what I want to see. And then you realize, I can't see it because I can't go inside. Normally, that's what happens. Here, this guide would basically say, the minute that you pop up your phone and check the Google Maps, where you go now, where you have to go to see the signal box of Herzog de Meron, because that probably would have been the next recommendation by the guide, um, there would be a little pictogram popping up um, refer referencing our uh, collection and say, yes, this is a nice building, but have you ever looked on the other side of the street? There is, in fact, a really incredible hospital. This is one of the most incredible hospitals I've ever seen. It's a building from the 1940s. Hermann Boyer and other architects um, made this project. It looks a little bit quirky uh, from the street, not exactly beautiful, but this building is amazing because it's entirely public. This is, this is the beautiful thing. N hospitals that I know really fulfill the definition by Michel Foucault of heterotopias. You know, they, they are another territory within a territory. They make you understand here is a space in which other rules apply. This is no longer the city. Well, this hospital is different. And it's an entire campus in the middle of Basel, which, and this entire thing is really public. You can go inside this hospital. So we would tell our, our users of the app, um, don't be scared. It's a hospital, but you can go in there even if you don't, if you're not sick. Uh, so go inside. There's this space. This kind of space doesn't really look like a hospital to me. It looks like a very, like generous passage. And in fact, you can go through this thing, and you will go, and you will end up in the park, which is one of the best parks in Basel. It's actually the hospital park, but they didn't use it. They don't use it as a pajama park where only like sick people walk around and you feel kind of displaced as a healthy person. No, everybody uses it. Actually, people use this as a shortcut to go to the other side of the hospital because the hospital has no barriers. There are no, um, no fences. Uh, there's basically houses with space in between and you can just pass through. So you can pass through this thing here. But here comes the, the, the interesting thing. I actually was in this hospital because the first thing I did when I came to Basel last year is I broke my hand. I heard that everybody does that. Uh, trying to ride a bike through the city, but there are so many tram rails that I got stuck into one and fell over. The good thing about it is I've learned this hospital, um, went there and found out they have the most amazing rooftop terrace that is public, and very few people know it, even Basel people. This is really strange. So we know that I know this now because I've spent there a week, so I would tell my, my people, uh, take the elevator at the end of this space, go to the seventh floor or the eighth, and you will end up in this space that in every kind of 
um, pathetic design boutique hotel would be called a sky lobby. Well, here, this is just the space in front of the elevator of a hospital. And it's beautiful, has this fantastic view of the city. It takes you to, to this gorgeous, wooden, wonderfully detailed stair that is a dream in itself. And then it takes you on this roof terrace that is 200 meters long. This is wild. This is just amazing for me. You feel like you're in Brazil. You know, this is no longer Switzerland, right? And you have this amazing view over the city. This, it's the best view over the city. It's much better than the Roche Tower, I think. In the Roche Tower, you're really up in the clouds. And the city is so far away that you feel depressed. You have to think, well, why do I have to be here? I want to be down there, you know? So, and here, you, you can go there. You can walk on this roof. It's public. You can go there. You take a bottle of wine, maybe discreetly stuck in the inside <laughs> of your jacket. You take your girlfriend a baguette and, a, um, and some nice cheese. And you have the most wonderful sundowner kind of uh, dinner conversation there. Um, and you see this view, the city is at your feet. And this is the moment where you realize the city, yes, it's my city. I can, I have access to it. It's interesting because actually at the left of this image, you see an area that's called Novartis um, campus, which is the in complete antithesis to this accessibility of the city. There it's a whole neighborhood that is designed like a city by Vittorio, Vittorio um, Lampognani, which is actually an interesting design for a, for a, for a campus. But then, um, because the idea was to actually to organize the campus as a neighborhood in the city, with streets, with squares, with public spaces, and great architecture in between them. They did all that, but they did something they shouldn't have done. They put a fence around, not the architects. That's, uh, that's the, uh, the company then. The CEO had the feeling there was a certain kind of risk of security. Now, well, probably hasn't heard that there are key cards today to control access of buildings, but, um, this is, this is a moment where I would like the, the, the visitors of our museum to understand that the best way to engage with, this, with the city and with the subject of our museum architecture is actually out there. It's not in our museum. Our museum, the, the spaces of the museum, for me, I consider them as a wunderkammer of enchantment where we make people realize that they have to leave. Right? That's the idea. We can tell them a couple of things. We can you know, make them sensible to, to certain kind of things. But basically, you want them to go out there and say, just discover this place, because this is the place. So if there's a Swiss architecture museum, then it should address the question of the territory, because it's the country in the world that I know that, that um, unites the biggest amount of high quality buildings on a very small footprint. That means you have the most insane density of great architectural moments in a territory that is best accessed by via public transport. Try to find that combination on Earth. I haven't. <coughs> so that's thing. That's this kind of museum app. And you would basically scan the environment like this. And where you see this kind of white rectangle, that's like a signal of the, like a symbol of the, uh, you know, the light, the lighting ceiling of museums. And it would indicate you, whenever it lights up, it would indicate that's the space. Go check it out. It's worth seeing. Um, another thing that we want to do, because I really think a Swiss architecture museum, because that's the, 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 the mission of my museum, cannot only be um, present in one city. But Basel, Basel is a fantastic city for an architectural um, museum, admittedly. Great architectural offices, lots of great architecture. But it's also, interestingly, on the periphery of the country. It's almost in another country. Right? It's almost in France and Germany. It's a very interesting location, I think. I like this kind of... Uh, very charming connotation of the Swiss-German term Randlage. Um, so it's a city that's on the edge. But how can you claim, um, let's say, a reach over, over something where you are at the, at the border of? Now, the idea would be to basically displace ourselves and cons consider the museum as a, as, a, as a nomadic institution. I would like to, to make a situationist museum where we actually go around the country, and we, on, we don't only make exhibitions. We can make that. We all can also send exhibitions uh, uh, throughout Switzerland. But we can also do other things. One thing that I would like to do is, for instance, uh, something that in Germany has been running very successfully under the title Ar Architekturquartett. That would basically be, you know, that's an institution where they have, this was founded by one architecture critic, Amber Seyer, by the Stuttgarter Zeitung. And she had this great idea to basically take a small, little town, provincial town, Ludwigsburg, near Stuttgart, 
and invite three people, um, an architecture critic, an, art an architect, and um, someone who is interested in architecture but from a layperson perspective, um, then they're not from the place. They check out three interesting buildings that have been currently b been done, um, see them together, and in the evening they make a discussion about these buildings and discuss the pros and cons. And it's the most amazing, you probably don't see it, the most amazing so societal event. They have an audience of 300 people, they do this twice a year, and people come dressed like for the opera. You can do this with architecture. Now, I would love to do this in, in Switzerland. Actually, this would have, would have been the kind of drawing. Basically, I want to do this every half year in another city, right? And go and, for instance, here in Geneva, I would talk to my uh, friends from the Maison de l'Architecture and, and say, tell me three polemical projects where people can't agree on whether this is crap or great. Um, I want to discuss about these buildings, and I will pick three people from somewhere else who have no clue of the city, who come there with a kind of uh, virgin perception, and let's dis discuss about it, and let's provoke this interesting collision of a local kind of building culture and a non-local culture of perception. Yeah, so that would be something like this. This is my museum, and this is basically one of 120 events that I do there per year, public events where we have discussions. And <clears throat> this was an event where we, uh, which we called Blind Date, where we had nine architects talking about their work. We didn't communicate the names of the architects because I think names are not important. They only discriminate between big names and small names. I would like to discriminate between good and bad. So we introduced a lot of architects that nobody knows, not even Switzerland. <clears throat> and also the architects among themselves didn't know who the other were. So they just found out, like, um, an hour before the event, so they couldn't arm themselves with discourse um, kind of gun bullets to uh, attack the other ones or defend themselves. Now, one of the key questions for me that is really um, the most tricky thing is actually how to make exhibitions about architecture, because I firmly believe you cannot exhibit architecture. I believe architecture exhibits itself for the reasons I discussed before. The, the basic difference is uh, to, to art, in art, you can take the work as such, l'oeuvre en, en soi, and you exhibit this beautiful uh, sculpture by Giacometti, and you have the entirety of its phenomenological existence right there in front of your eye and your body. It's in your reach, and you can perceive everything. This is not a representation. This is the thing itself. Well, in architecture, we can never do this. We can't place buildings inside buildings because buildings are usually too big to fit in other buildings. You see this here. This is a construction site of the um, 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 Eiffel Tower, uh, no, no, of the, um, of the Statue of Liberty, when it was built by the Atelier Eiffel. Um, so it's, it's the cast that, that they're producing. And you see beautifully how the, the, this sculpture, with its architectural uh, kind of scale, explodes the scale of this building. And these, these kind of f human, humans that you see in the picture, they become these kind of bonsai versions of themselves. Um, Every now and then, there is the beautiful luxury for a museum to actually exhibit a building in a one-to-one -one scale mock-up. The U House was such an incredible situation. You know, this is this fantastic house by Toyo Ito, which he built for his sister that had lost her husband in a car accident. And she asked him to build him a house where she could properly mourn the house. She did that for seven years. And after she was finished with mourning and could go on with her life, she said, OK, the house did, a, did its job for me. Now demolish it. I no longer need it. I need it to go so that I can continue living. Tough job for an architect. He did it. But he found a museum where he could rebuild it, <laughs> at least for six weeks. And uh, this was in Aachen. And there, they actually rebuilt it one to one scale. And you could have this amazing experience to go through these spaces that were the spaces of, of mourning for this, for this woman as a visitor now. Um, but this is very, very rare. Most of the times, we have this scale uh, issue. Now, I've always found big inspiration in the work of land art, and I found it interesting, their transition from minimal art to uh, land art, because they all started with minimal art installations in the gallery context of North America. But uh, some of them, like Carl Andre and Robert Smithson, gradually grew uh, bigger with the scale of the installations. And in the end, um, Carl Andre once did this proposal for a sculpture to be um, exhibited in the third floor of a gallery building in New York, where the load of the wood that he wanted to pile upon each other proved to be too heavy. It would have collapsed the building. And this was the moment where we said, OK, I have to go out. This is too small. This is no longer the context I can work in. 
Smithson had the same thing. He said, I want to work with real material of the territory, and went on and did these beautiful projects that we all know, the spiral jetty and so on. However, what I could learn from these people was that they also found at the same time, because artists also have to make money at the same time, so they need to produce some sellable artwork, and he found a way how to actually sort of take back this kind of ultimate uh, physicality of this, of this approach back into the space of the gallery. He did this amazingly beautiful and provocative works that are called non-sites, where he went to a real site, in this case, the city of Essen in the Ruhr area, it's a mining area in uh, G Germany, and took earth from that very site and placed it in the gallery uh, context with this beautiful mirror installation. I'm not sure if you can see it on this mirroring display. Um, <coughs> and y suddenly, this was no longer just a representation. You could smell this dirt. You could touch it if the god wasn't looking, right? Um, <coughs> and um, you said, yeah, this gives, me, this gives me appetite for the real thing. Where, where did... Where does this earth come from? You know, this would have been my question. I want to see the place where he stole this from. And <coughs> now, so this is, this is basically what I'm uh, trying to do with these exhibition techniques or these, these techniques where we work outside uh, the museum. So the very first exhibition that I did in last uh, autumn was an exhibition where we basically closed the museum. And I said, well, an architecture museum has to be, by definition, always also a city museum. It's about the city, because what is architecture if not the most noble pretext to produce a city? You know, no, no more desperate thing than a collection of buildings that produce no city. Do you remember the Orders Project in the Inner Mongolia of, chi of, of China, where they had hundreds uh, of architects piled up to produce single-family houses for rich people, and they were in a desert? Devastating experience. So for me, the city is more important than the city, and the architecture is a means to produce the city. So therefore, we said, OK, we have to work with public space as well. This is just an exhibition space as the exhibition space is inside the museum. And we made a public call um, on our social media sites and asked our visitors to send us pictures, uh, videos, and photographs of, of a place in Switzerland that, that they feel personally connected to. And we got a lot of pictures and had a cinematic um, installation, basically a video that combined all these um, places, and it would display them on the windows of our museum. By the way, um, in Switzerland that means, or in Basel, it means you have to get a building permit for this installation, for basically shoot shooting photons to the inner face of your uh, windows. Um, we had this running for two weeks in the evening, uh, and it really changed the perception of many people of what an architecture museum is. And um, I was very happy that we could basically um, state at the very beginning of, um, of this tenure of, of my directorship that architecture has to do with specific places, with architecture, with infrastructure, with public space, with movement, with time, with people, and with the interrelation of all of them. And that the idea of a museum, or let's say the notion of a museum, as we know it from 19th century, is a point of departure, but can no longer be the formula um, through which we conjugate uh, the possibilities of this type of uh, concept of a cultural institution. I think in the 21st century, a museum has to be, first of all, an instigator of interaction of social interaction. We shouldn't leave this to the social media. We should understand that space itself is social, right? And for there, we need to create a perception of our spaces that involves always the perception of the other one to understand what is public space about. It's a layering of different interpretations of the same thing. And um, this then creates society. And for me, this is the mission of my museum. Thank you very much.